Don, what's going on? How are you doing? I'm, I'm doing good. Greetings to Hawaii. Fantastic. Jerome. Hawaii! God, I've never done an interview with anybody in Hawaii. Well, that's great. It's great to be talking to you. A huge aloha, mahalo, welcome, and, and uh, thank you so much for doing this. Okay. Pleasure. And uh, we are, you're part of a series we're doing called Off the Road, talking with artists around the world during the pandemic about their new projects and stuff. So we have a few right. standard sort of questions to, to get you into the bit. Where are you joining us from today? And is this where you've been since uh, the crisis began? I, I live near uh, Cambridge in the UK. Okay. Well, I've, I've lived here for 40 years. Great. We used to live in London, but we moved out for a couple of years, but we just ended up staying. So nice. You nice. Know, I live in the English countryside thatched houses and so do you have any stories done as to how the pandemic entered your life and any of any experiences from when it began till now the way it's either affected both the production of this new record turning to crime or just your life in general that that you want to share well, well it was very funny I, I had a bit of a incident i was taken very ill and i, um, I went into hospital and when i went into hospital um in uh, february 2020 the the world was a normal place. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I didn't come out for two months. They kept me in for two months. And you could feel the pandemic coming coming up the motorway towards Cambridge, you know. And w when I came out, my wife picked me up and I hadn't seen her for, for a month. Uh, no, for six weeks. And we drove the 12 miles home and we didn't see one person. We didn't see one car. It was like everybody had gone to the moon, you know, strangest experience of my life. Wow. And you had been in for a totally separate illness and thankfully didn't get COVID either. Yeah, it wasn't COVID. Yeah. Good for you, man. Well, great that you have your health. And yeah, what a surreal experience. There's been so yeah. many uh, during this thing. And and how has it affected this turning to crime for Deep Purple fans, Don, in particular, but also anyone who appreciates classic rock, because this is a very unusual record, sort of explain the album's concept and how this came together. Yes, well, it was, you know, what are we going to do? Um, we had to cancel... All, all the shows for 2020, you know, move them on to 2021. Things were looking a bit bleak, you know, there was no vaccine. Um, there, was, there were so many people dying in the United Kingdom, you know. Mm -hmm. I think we had a bigger death rate than America, actually. Not as big as Brazil, though, but close. Um, and we're all on the phone to each other. What, what, what can we do? And I, I feel... There'd always been the idea of doing a covers album, and I think it was Ian Gillan's idea. Hmm. But how are we going to do it? Well, Bob Ezrin suggested, why don't we do it remotely? You know, file share. Um, and that's so what it, you did. It, that's what we did. And I did four demos, you know, with a drum machine. Roger did four. Steve Morse did four. And we kind of circulated them. Wow. And there were a few comments, but when they came back with Ian Pace's drums on them, Everyone kind of went, this is really happening. You know, he'd done such such great stuff on the back, on, on the demo tracks, you know. Which of these tunes, there's so many interesting songs to have Deep Purple yeah. covering this wide range of tunes. Which of the ones, I'll tell you a couple I'm attached to, but which of the ones yeah. are you most attached to on this thing? Um, I, th I, th I think um, Let the Good Times Roll. <laughs> I think it's great. And um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, I like oh, oh well. I think it's a bit of a ma masterpiece. You know, I think we've done it justice. There, there's all these tunes that classic rock fans would know, and some of them are really like Little Feet's Dixie Chicken <laughs> to hear <Yeah. laughs> to hear Deep Purple playing that, especially you sliding in there on the piano and stuff. Whose idea was it to cover like some of these tunes, like that one? I, Who's think, that? I think it was Steve Morse. Okay, it makes sense. Right. I mean, he, he's a big Little Feet fan. You know, he lives. He's, he's a southern boy, Steve, yeah. and um, he wanted to do some, you know, down home rock. What was your what were your selections? Was Oh Well one of the ones you suggested? Uh, uh, no, Oh Well was Steve. Well, oh Well was everybody. Okay. It was, you, know, you know we had these phone conferences and uh, that's how we decided. The ones I did were, I did the medley, which was just um, I put together a lot of tunes. You know we just come on and jam in, uh, in the encore before we go into hush or something. You know you give a little blast of uh, 
give me some loving or something. Oh, and that's a people should. That is one of the most standout tracks. That's crazy. So you get caught in the act. They have this thing. It wraps up the record, and it has. It starts with Jeff Beck group. I'm going down. Then it has Booker T and the MGs, Green Onions. Then it goes into the Allman Brothers band, Hot Lana. Then it goes into Led Zeppelin's Dazed and Confused, and then ends with Spencer Davis group. You're the one who came up with that idea. Yeah, yeah. I stuck it all together. <laughs> I've got I'm quite the proud of the way on. I got uh, dazed and confused to segue into give me some loving, you know. <laughs> and the, yeah, and and Booker T, almonds. These are like things that you obviously, as a keyboardist, I'm assuming you connected to. I, I mean, I'm very pleased with uh, the Allman Brothers track because, well, we played Atlanta um, a couple of years ago. Well, we, yeah, 2019 we played Atlanta, so we we played Hot Lana you know? there. But uh, the way it's come out on the record, it, I sound exactly like Greg. <laughs> you know, it, it's just that could be Greg playing, and I, I think it's the thing I'm most proud of. <laughs> <laughs> were you, obviously you were a fan. Ever get to spend any time with Greg over the years? I, I met him once. I, I actually jammed with him. Where? Um, we tell that story. In, in London, we used to do a thing. It was a thing called a tennis jam. The people who put Wimbledon on, they used to have a party and they used to hire a rock band. Bernie Marsden used to organize it. Okay. And sometimes they used to do it. It was always a great thing to do. You know, Pat Cash played and John McEnroe, but we'd have a band. And uh, once we're doing it and halfway, I looked up and there's Greg Allman <laughs> across the other playing Hammond. And, um, uh, you know, Warren, Warren from Warren uh, Haynes, Warren Haynes, standing right next to me, and we start jamming away, and I can't believe it's Greg. You know, he just played great. <laughs> so I chatted to him afterwards, and Warren said, "Oh, we're playing the Albert Hall in a couple of days. You're invited." <laughs> wow! But I, I couldn't go because I, I had a gig somewhere. But. Um, what, what, what's neat about your career, Don, is all the connections you've got. And, and we would be here for days trying to go through all of them. But you have some incredible chapters. And, and I used to play drums a bit. And two of my very fa my two very favorite drummers would be John Bonham and then Cozy Powell. And Cozy yeah. it factors early in your illustrious career. Tell that story. Um, yeah, I, I, I got a phone call and, and somebody said, oh, it was a guy called Cozy Cole. <laughs> you up I said god what would Benny Dro Benny Goodman's drummer want with me <laughs> but they oh no no I looked at the message that was Cozy Pell Ooh! so I, I, I went along the audition I took a mini Moog and uh, my Fender Rhodes and so and walked into this place and it looked like it was a drum shop <laughs> <laughs> and, and Cozy turns up in um in an e purple E-type Jaguar <laughs> playing some some amazing thing he was playing dear darto um some piece by dear darto and he walked in put some boxing boots up he said right chap you ready what do you want to play <laughs> so i said well you know that piece that was playing on your um stereo when you came in the dear darto track yeah why don't we play that okay so it starts off with a keyboard intro you know da 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 and Cozy came walloping in. I'd never heard anything like it in my life. And I, I just remember thinking, God, I love some of that. You know, and I just, I just went with him. We played two or three songs. And, um, you know, I went back and we, we waited a couple of days for the phone to ring. But it eventually did. And it was Cozy. Half past ten at night. Saying, you got the, goal, you got the job. And Amazing. I was just... I was delighted. Yeah. What a great, and that was one of the first uh, big gigs. You also end up playing with Richie Blackmore's Rainbow. Now, your path didn't cross with Dio, right? Ronnie James Dio had already left? Or... Well, it actually did cross momentarily. Um, as I went in through, the, there was a swing door to the rehearsal room. <laughs> and as I went in, I saw Ronnie Dio walking out. I thought, oh, that was Ronnie. Um, so I went in and... Um, I kind of auditioned at Richie's house, you know, we, we played a bit of music together. And then, you know, I got on the Hammond and, you know, it just went very well. But there was no Ronnie there. At, at the end of the second, I said to Richie, uh, I said, I thought I thought I saw Ronnie. And uh, Richie said, 
Oh yeah, yeah. No, Ronnie's gone. Wow. <laughs> <was> only... <laughs> How <Ronnie's> weird. Gone. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I said, keep on my toes here. And that was what Graham Bonnet then became the singer when you were. Uh... Yeah, Graham came in at a later stage. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's really wild because then you end up. So you just pass him in like a revolving doorway or whatever. And funny enough, you end up being. And, and the way I got introduced to you as a kid, you were Ozzy Osbourne's keyboardist. And it was yeah. like such a huge era for Ozzy. What a gig. Tell the story of getting that. And any like, when you think of that gig, if there's like a funniest, most outrageous moment over there, all those years where they're hanging the dwarf name Ronnie or all of the crazy <laughs> shows that you guys would do, uh, share it with us. Maybe you were even there when the bad incident happened. Oh, I was there, yeah. <laughs> I, that was very funny, actually. I, you know, I was up on the ramparts of the castle where the, the keyboards were up. So I'm, so I'm looking down and I saw we were doing uh, Suicide Solution. And there was a thing, people were throwing stuff on stage, you know, animals and uh, dead cat and, uh, oh, you know, funny things were going on. And I saw Ozzy walking around with, with a bat, with the, this pair of wings flapping this huge thing and eventually kind of threw it away and uh, when I came off stage at the end I said God Ozzy whatever did you have in your mouth he said he said I thought it was a plastic bat thought it was a real one <laughs> I said bloody hell he said, it bit me too that's why I let it go <laughs> I said what it bit you Everybody laughed. He, he said, yeah, we better find it and give it, give it some Aussie serum. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they were, nobody could find the, the bat. I mean, it, it vanished. But everybody laughed. And I went to Sharon and I said, Sharon, this is serious, you know. Nah. I said, D you know, rats are, uh, bats are rabid. You know, Aussie could get rabies. You got, we got to take him to the hospital. So... so <laughs> We took him to the hospital. He was he refused to. It was freezing outside, so he just was in his underpants <laughs> and his cloak. <laughs> and we took him in the hospital, and he started barking. <laughs> How are you feeling? <laughs> he started doing all that. It was very, very funny. But he stopped barking when they they gave him the shots in his backside. Right, right. That's, uh, that shut him up. What an experience. Uh, any favorite, when you look back at all those all those crazy uh, gigs that you've gotten to do, um, is there anything that like a hero encounter that stands out where over the course of your life, a person you've really admired, like kind of like the Greg Allman thing has showed up or you've had a brush with greatness that when you think back is really one of the highlights of your career? Well, it, it's, it's funny. We were with, I was playing with in the Game of Blues Band and uh, we, we got the Montreux Jazz Festival, you know, great excitement. <laughs> and Gary said, we're being supported by Little Feet. I said, hell man, we better be good if we've got them supporting us. So we got there, you know, and um, they, they were sound checking. At the end of the sound check, I, I went up to Billy Payne and, you know, introduced myself. And he said, and he said the nicest thing to me, he said, hell Don, I know who you are. And... Uh, you know, we had a bit of a chat. I was, I'm such an admirer of his, and their gig was just fantastic. Wow. And we went on, and we didn't disgrace ourselves. But it's funny, it's just come out on Amazon Prime. Th this gig has emerged, that actual gig of the Gary Moore blues band playing Mont Montreux. And it's absolutely incredible. Gary's, I mean, we, we've, he really pulled out all the stops, you know, after a little feed. We, we had to. <laughs> so that, that was a great night. That's cool. I never heard Gary play better. Say again. I never heard Gary play better than he did that night. Wow, that's really cool, and and that's uh, coming full circle with the new record, uh, playing the uh, the Dixie Chicken on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is crazy. I hope Billy hears it and, and doesn't get upset. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. I bet they'll find it real flattering. Uh, I really had fun talking to you today. I hope that, that you had fun doing this, my brother. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Hello, it's Don Airy from Deep Purple. I am back to support HBR's fundraising campaign. If you consume public radio, you have got to be a member. And to all our members, a big mahalo. But to those of you who have not joined, yes, you, the door is open, mate. Join us and a big mahala. 
Oh, Don, you're such a good sport, man. I'm giving you high fives. I met you one time in, in uh, 2000, I forget where it was. It was a Deep Purple show in Boston, uh, or when it was. It was in the. Oh, yeah. It was at the uh, the Tweeter Center. But you were a real sweet dude, and, and I just can't say enough nice stuff about it. I've loved your work, seen you bunches of times. Saw you with Jethro Tull that time at the Tower, oh, wow. the Tower Theater, Philadelphia, when you and Doan Perry did that incredible like keyboard drum. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember that? Like an improvisation that you would do? Yeah. It was very, very cool. So, I mean, I've been a fan for a long time. Just had to mention I saw some of that stuff because I, I don't know if everybody remembers that from, from your career. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, very nice talking to you. You too. Take care, Don. Aloha, brother. Okay. All the best. Bye-bye.